Okay, so alaikum everyone. My name is Ariz Shafat. Um, this is a lecture on the feed fast cycle. This presentation is tightly linked to your other lectures on the metabolic effects of insulin and glucagon and the pathogenesis of diabetes and the consequences of diabetes. Okay. Is there any problem with the recording or can we proceed, Yeni? You can proceed. Okay. Okay, so to learn about metabolism from the beginning, you need to know why you eat. You eat because your food has macronutrients in the form of carbohydrates, in the form of proteins, in the form of fats or lipids. These get broken down in the GI tract to glucose, amino acid, and fatty acids. Glucose, you know, when it enters cells, it's converted into pyruvate by glycolysis. That pyruvate is made into acetyl-CoA by an enzyme called PDH or pyruvate dehydrogenase. The same thing happens for uh, proteins. They get broken down into amino acids in the GI tract. The amino acids get absorbed. They enter cells. For energy, they're made into acetyl-CoA or pyruvate, which then gets converted into acetyl-CoA. In your GI lectures, you studied how you ingest triglycerides. They're broken down by pancreatic lipase. Then they're surrounded by bile to form micelles. Those micelles are absorbed. Fatty acids enter cells, are absorbed and then enter cells. From uh, in cells, they um, go through a process of beta oxidation to form acetyl-CoA. So all of the macronutrients that you eat, they get funneled into acetyl-CoA. And eventually that acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle then to generate these electron carriers, then they're made into ATP. So all of these processes funnel down into acetyl-CoA. Half of the energy you use is used to make ATP. The other half maintains body temperature, is lost as heat, yani. okay? So that's the big picture of why you eat. This is another big picture kind of graph. It shows you at time zero, a person ingests a high glucose meal. At minute 20, his blood glucose goes up because all that glucose is absorbed. From minute 20 to minute 120, the, or the next 100 minutes, his blood glucose drops back to normal. So when so during this part of the graph, what hormone is active? You would say insulin is active because insulin is responsible for uh, utilizing glucose and lowering blood glucose after a meal. Okay, In diabetes, then it's very easy to understand what happens because you don't have insulin effect. The insulin doesn't have its effect either because it's not there in type 1 diabetes, or your cells aren't responding to insulin properly in type 2 diabetes. In any case, you will have hyperglycemia because there's no insulin effect. So when the guy eats a meal, his blood glucose stays high, okay? So you have chronic or long-term hyperglycemia. An interesting thing about this graph is that you notice that even in diabetics, their blood glucose eventually does come down. And that's because there are insulin-independent cells in your body. There are two major cells you need to know, two major tissues you need to know, the red blood cells and the brain, okay? These two, the brain and the red blood cells do not rely on insulin to take up glucose. So even in diabetics, even though the decrease in blood glucose is slow, slower than in a normal person, it does still happen because the red blood cells and the brain, they're still taking up glucose at a steady pace and utilizing it, okay? Good. So this is what the doctor said in their lecture. Uh, to make you understand metabolism. Whenever I look at a metabolic pathway, whenever I look at glycolysis or fatty acid synthesis, I always ask myself these four questions. Number one is what condition should the body be in for that pathway to occur? So for example, glycolysis converts glucose into pyruvate for energy. In order for glycolysis to be activated, you need glucose. That means you need to be in a well-fed state or you need to just have had a meal, okay? In uh, a, the, your feed uh, cycle needs to be activated. In that condition, what hormone will be active? Insulin would be active in a well-fed condition. Insulin in general activates enzymes by dephosphorylation or at the gene level, okay? The dephosphorylation effect is quicker. The gene effect, the gene expression effect is slower. Regardless of its mechanism, insulin works to store glucose. The glucose goes into cells, it's stored as glycogen, or is made into triglycerides or fatty acids, yani. okay? Then how are these pathways regulated? I said, I told you that insulin regulates pathways at the gene level or by dephosphorylation. 
Going the other way, let's say you're in a fasting condition. Let's take gluconeogenesis. In what condition must the body be in for gluconeogenesis to be activated? You would say in a starving condition or a fasting condition. In that setting, what hormones will be active? Glucagon would be active, epinephrine would be active, and cortisol would be active. Because these three hormones, glucagon, cortisol, epinephrine, they counter the effects of insulin, they're called counter-regulatory hormones, okay? So in a fasting condition, counter-regulatory hormones are active. These hormones produce glucose, either by glycogen breakdown or glycogenolysis or production of new glucose or gluconeogenesis. In general, these hormones act the same as insulin. They can act at the gene level or they can phosphorylate enzymes. Insulin dephosphorylated enzymes, these counter-regulatory hormones, they can phosphorylate enzymes, okay? So just to give you an example, this is glycolysis. You don't need to know the pathway here, but just in general, yeah. So just in general, what condition must the body be in for glycolysis to happen? We said well-fed. That means insulin needs to be active. That means insulin must activate glycolysis. By, what, by which mechanisms? Insulin activates glycolysis at the gene level by increasing expression of glucokinase in the liver. Insulin activates glycolysis by dephosphorylating PFK2. And that activates glycolysis. So again, those two mechanisms, okay? The same thing here. When you eat a high-carbohydrate meal, glucose, uh, your in, uh, insulin is active. You're in a well-fed condition. So glycogen synthesis happens in a well-fed condition. How does insulin activate glycogen or glycogenesis? Insulin activates glycogen synthase by dephosphorylation. Because this effect is by dephosphorylation and not at the gene level, it's quick to happen. Okay, gene expression effects of hormones take longer to happen. Going the other way, when you're when you're fasting or in starving conditions, um, glucagon is active, epinephrine is active, cortisol is active, but it's not shown here. Glucagon activates glycogen phosphorylase by phosphorylation and epinephrine too by phosphorylation. These hormones are active. I told you how they act and they cause glucose production. Okay, so these four questions, what condition the body is in, what hormones are present, how are these hormones active, uh, what pathways are these hormones activating and by which mechanisms, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, and at the gene level, these four questions help you to understand any metabolic pathway. Okay. We'll go into a bit more detail here because this is mole two. Fatty acid synthase, ask yourself the question, what condition must the body be in for fatty acid synthesis to occur? To synthesize fats, you need a lot of energy. So the fatty acid synthesis occurs in well-fed conditions. In these conditions, what hormone is active? Insulin. How does this hormone function? Dephosphorylation and at the gene level. So let's look at this. Glucose is present in the bloodstream after a high carbohydrate meal. Glucose gets converted converted into pyruvate by a glycolysis. Pyruvate enters the mitochondria. This is all happening in the liver, by the way. Pyruvate get, then gets burned in the Krebs cycle. As a byproduct of the Krebs cycle, you're generating oxaloacetate. That eventually gets converted into citrate and that accumulates. Citrate goes back into the cytoplasm, where it's converted back into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is converted into malonyl-CoA by an enzyme called acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Malonyl CoA is made into fatty acids uh, by an enzyme called fatty acid synthase. Okay. It's important to remember insulin activates acetyl CoA carboxylase and fatty acid synthase by dephosphorylation and at the gene level. Okay. Another important thing for fatty acid synthesis you need to remember is that fats are the major storage form of energy in the body. Glycogen is not the major storage form of glucose because glycogen contains oxygen and hydrogen bonds and carbon and oxygen bonds. These bonds are polar. That makes glycogen osmotic, i.e. it holds onto water. So that means your liver cells and your muscle cells can only store a limited amount of glycogen because if they store a lot of glycogen, they, because glycogen is osmotic, it would hold onto water and then it will cause enlargement and death of the cell. So that's why glycogen, there's a very specific amount you can store. In contrast, fatty acids are hydrophobic and triglycerides are hydrophobic. So they don't hold on to water so you can store as much as you like. Okay, so that's why fats are the major storage form of energy in the body. And that's why in glycogen storage diseases that you covered in mole one, you saw that there uh, clinically patients with glycogen storage diseases had liver enlargement and uh, muscle damage, etc. Because there's only a, a limited amount of glycogen you should normally be storing. Okay.
So that's fatty acid synthesis. Let's move on to lipoprotein metabolism. Again, this is more too, so we'll go into a bit more detail. This, these are from your GI lectures. You ingest dietary fat. That fat gets broken down in the small intestine in the duodenum by pancreatic lipase, gets surrounded by bile. That uh, Those lipid digestion products get absorbed in the enterocyte or the intestinal cells, okay? In the intestinal cells, these lipid digestion products are remade or re-esterified and packaged into lipoproteins called chylomicrons. Chylomicrons have a protein called B48. B48 is essential for the exocytosis or secretion of chylomicrons from the enterocyte into the lymphatics. So now chylomicrons are in the lymphatics. They have B48, which they use to get out of the intestinal cell into the lymphatics, okay? So they're moving through the lymphatics. They go into the thoracic duct, into the circulation. In the circulation, they run into HDL or high-density lipoprotein. H, they bump into HDL and HDL gives them APOE and APOC2. They didn't have APOE and APOC2 in the beginning. They got these two from HDL. Functionally, APOE is responsible for uptake of lipoproteins by the liver. APOC2 activates LPL. When these chylomicrons expressing these three proteins go into circulation, they have APOC2. APOC2 activates lipoprotein lipase, which is expressed in the endothelial cells of the blood vessels of, uh, of, uh, uh, of adipose tissue. And this LPL basically starts extracting triglycerides from the chylomicrons. Because it's extracting triglycerides from the chylomicrons, the chylomicron starts to shrink. Eventually, it becomes a chylomicron remnant. Because it's lost a lot of its triglyceride, it doesn't need the APOC2 anymore. So it gives it back to HDL. This chylomicron remnant is taken up by the liver by APOE. Okay? Why am I telling you this? Is because it's also important to remember that insulin activates LPL at the gene level. Okay, so when you eat a high carbohydrate meal and insulin is released, insulin also, also activates LPL. In this way, insulin promotes storage of fats or extraction of fats from chylomicrons. Okay? When these chylomicrons are taken up by the liver, at the same time, insulin is acting on the liver to promote fatty acid synthesis and triglyceride synthesis, right? So if you saw here, when you synthesize fatty acids, they're joined to glycerol to form triglycerides. These triglycerides are packaged into VLDLs and they're secreted into the bloodstream, okay? And these VLDLs express B100. B100 is responsible for their secretion from the liver into the bloodstream, okay? So now a VLDL gets like chylomicron, it gets APOE and APOC2 by HDL. HDL gives it to them. And these three proteins, APOC2 activates LPL again, the same story. VLDL start giving off uh, triglycerides to uh, adipose tissue and muscle because of LPL or lipoprotein lipase. The VLDL then starts to shrink. It forms an IDL. It doesn't need the APOC2 anymore because it's given a lot of the triglyceride away. It gives it back to HDL. Now, IDL has two options. By APOE, it can get taken up by the liver, and that's the end of the story. Or it can run into hepatic lipase, and in this results in IDL giving up more triglycerides. So percentage-wise, now the IDL, majority of the IDL is composed of cholesterol, okay? Because it's given away all the triglycerides. Now what happens is that the IDL can give APOE away back to HDL. Now, IDL with only B100 is called LDL. LDL has two options. Most of it gets taken up by the liver, by the LDL receptor. The bad thing about LDL is that your peripheral tissues express the LDL receptor as well. So in this way, LDL can deposit cholesterol into peripheral tissues. Another bad thing about LDL is that this B100 can get oxidized by reactive oxygen species. And this oxidized LDL can get recognized by macrophages as foreign. So macrophages take it up by their scavenger receptor B1. And macrophages start accumulating cholesterol and eventually form foam, foam cells. And this production of foam cells is essential for the formation of atherosclerotic plaques, which are responsible for strokes and MIs, etc. Okay. So in this way, LDL represents bad cholesterol because it has oxidized LDL and that can promote formation of atherosclerotic plaques. On the other hand, HDL is synthesized by the liver and by the small intestine. It contains APO, it expresses APOA, APOC, and APOE. APOA is responsible for it activating an enzyme called LCAT. LCAT, what it does is that it picks up cholesterol from peripheral tissues 
deposits it into HDL in the form of cholesterol esters. And these cholesterol esters within HDL are delivered back to the liver. So in this way, the liver picks up, in this way, the HDL picks up cholesterol from peripheral tissues and, and takes it back to the liver. And this is why HDL is called good cholesterol, okay? So this is lipoprotein metabolism. You can ask yourself these four questions. What conditions the body in? Well-fed, what hormone is active? Insulin. What pathway is insulin activating? Lipoprotein lipase. By which mechanism? Gene expression, okay? Gluconeogenesis, this is mole one. But again, what conditions the body in? For you to produce glucose, you don't need to have glucose. So you should be in fasting or starvation conditions. What hormone would be active? Glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol, or the counter-regulatory hormones. How do they act? They activate enzymes such as PEP carboxykinase by phosphorylation and at the gene level. At the gene level, that's the major mechanism, okay? Because if at the gene level, gluconeogenesis takes some time to kick in fully because it's at the gene level and gene expression takes time. The two things I need you to know from this slide about gluconeogenesis is that gluconeogenesis requires energy. For pyruvate to go back into glucose, you're using energy here. You're using ATP and you're using GTP. That's one thing, okay? The other thing is that you need a source of pyruvate to make glucose, okay? So in starvation conditions, you need a source of pyruvate to make glucose. So those are two things you need to remember from this slide. Lipolysis going to the adipose tissue in starvation conditions. What, what condition must the body be in for you to do lipolysis? The body must, to break down fat, you don't need to have energy, so you should be fasting or in starvation. What hormones are active? Cortisol is active, epinephrine is active, glucagon is active. Epinephrine and cortisol activate an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase by phosphorylation. This breaks down triglycerides in the adipose tissue into glycerol and fatty acid. The glycerol goes to the liver. And over here, you see that the glycerol can be made into glucose by gluconeogenesis. So that's what's shown here. The glycerol from fat, fat breakdown from in the adipose tissue during starvation, it goes to the liver and it's made into glucose by gluconeogenesis stimulated by glucagon and cortisol at the gene level. With fatty acids, it's a different story. Fatty acids go to, into the bloodstream. They're bound by albumin because they're hydrophobic. Because they're bound by albumin, that means fatty acids cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. They go to the liver to make to get burned and to, uh, to form acetyl-CoA by beta oxidation, and this produces energy. Okay, this energy is used to fuel gluconeogenesis. So the acetyl-CoA itself isn't being used for gluconeogenesis, but the energy you're generating from beta oxidation that's being used to fuel gluconeogenesis because gluconeogenesis is energy requiring. Okay, Fat, fatty acids can also go to the muscle to get uh, beta oxidized for ATP. This is how the muscles utilize this fat muscles utilize fatty acids during starvation for energy. Because fatty acids are bound to albumin, they don't enter the brain. Okay, so what happens in prolonged fasting? You're having a lot of beta oxidation, so you're accumulating a lot of acetyl CoA. This overwhelms Krebs cycle and ATP production and the excess acetyl CoA gets made into ketone bodies. And these ketone bodies are essential because they can cross the blood brain barrier and so they can be utilized by the brain. So the brain utilizes glucose in majority of the circumstances, but in prolonged fasting, it utilizes ketones. It doesn't utilize fatty acids because fatty acids cannot cross the blood brain barrier. Okay. So just to recap, what are the two pathways by which insulin and glucagon regulate enzymes? Both of them can act by gene expression. Insulin acts by dephosphorylation. Glucagon acts by phosphorylation. Insulin activates pathways which use up glucose, either for energy or either as energy or for storage. So insulin will activate glycolysis, uh, synthesis of glycogen or glycogenesis, fatty acid synthesis, Glycolysis is by PFK2 and glucokinase. Glycogenesis is by glycogen synthase. Fatty acid synthesis is by acetyl CoA carboxylase and fatty acid synthase. And fat deposition, when we looked at lipoproteins, is because insulin activates lipoprotein lipase at the gene level. On the other hand, the counter regulatory hormones, these activate pathways which produce glucose or they produce ketones. So they activate glycogen breakdown by activating glycogen phosphorylase. They activate gluconeogenesis. They activate lipolysis by activating hormone-sensitive lipase, and they activate ketogenesis.
how would this balance be perturbed or disturbed or disrupted in diabetes? Diabetes is a condition where you don't have the insulin effect. So what happens is that the insulin is acting to store glucose or use up glucose. The counter-regulatory hormones are working to produce glucose or uh, to, ex uh, to produce glucose or to utilize it as ketone body and to produce ketone bodies and to break down fats. When you don't have insulin, as in diabetes, what you have is a lot of production of glucose, so you have hyperglycemia. You have a lot of fat breakdown, so these patients usually start losing weight. And you, they have elevated free fatty acids. And this elevated free fatty acids, when they go to the liver, because there's so much, they produce a lot of acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA gets shunted into ketone bodies, and so these patients have ketone body production. So in type 1 diabetes particularly, because you'd have absolute insulin deficiency, because you don't have the insulin, these patients have hyperglycemia, these patients can develop accelerated lipolysis, and they can develop ketoacidosis. Okay? Now, just to tie in everything together, we'll cover the pathways now, which occur simultaneously when you've just eaten a high carbohydrate meal or you're in the well-fed state, okay? The first thing you need to know is that the red blood cells and the brain, these express GLUT1 and GLUT3. This is very important for you to know, for example, okay? These are insulin independent. So regardless of whether insulin is present or not, as we said, when we looked at the glucose tolerance curve, the red blood cell and the brain, they don't rely on insulin because they express GLUT1 and GLUT3. And GLUT1 and GLUT3 are insulin independent. And so the brain and the red blood cell are taking up glucose at a very steady pace, regardless of how much insulin you have. Another point you need to know here is that the red blood cells lack mitochondria. So the red blood cells can only carry out anaerobic glycolysis. So they will produce glucose. They will uh, uh, take in glucose. Glucose will get converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate won't get converted to acetyl-CoA because that happens in the mitochondria and red blood cells don't have mitochondria. So the pyruvate gets uh, chunted into lactic acid production or anaerobic metabolism. That's the only metabolic pathway active in red blood cells, okay? The second thing you need to know is what's going on in the liver. The liver expresses GLUT2. This is also very important for you to know. The GLUT2 expressed on the liver is also insulin independent. So insulin tells the liver what to do with the glucose, but it doesn't tell the liver to take up the glucose. Insulin is telling the liver to produce uh, pyruvate by, by activating glycolysis. Insulin is telling the liver to produce glycogen when the ATP stores are sufficient. The excess glucose gets converted to glycogen because of insulin activating glycogen synthase by dephosphorylation. When you store the optimal amount of glycogen, the excess acetyl-CoA and the excess energy you have gets shunted into fatty acid production because insulin activates acetyl-CoA carboxylase and fatty acid synthase. Okay, All of this is mediated by insulin. Insulin also tells acetyl-CoA to get converted to cholesterol. All of this is being controlled by insulin, but insulin isn't telling the liver to take up glucose because GLUT2 is insulin independent. So in the exam, they can ask you which of the following GLUT transporters or glucose transporters are insulin independent. You would say GLUT1, 2, and 3. They're ex where they express GLUT1 and 3 in the red blood cells in the brain, GLUT2 in the liver, also in the pancreas, but it's not important for this diagram. So now insulin is telling the liver what to do with the glucose. At the same time, insulin is going to the adipose tissue, to the adipocyte, and it's telling the adipose tissue that I've just told the liver to produce fats, and the liver is going to package them in VLDLs, and they're going to they're gonna get APOC2. So I want you to start expressing lipoprotein lipase to increase gene expression of lipoprotein lipase. So as VLDLs are coming into the circulation, and chylomicrons are in the circulation when you've eaten a meal, LPL is activated by insulin or upregulated by insulin. This starts extracting the fatty acids because it breaks down, uh, LPL breaks down triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids. The fatty acids are taken up by the adipocyte. The glycerol goes back to the liver to get joined again to fatty acids to produce more triglycerides packaged, to be packaged into more lipoproteins or VLDLs, okay? So the glycerol itself isn't getting taken up into the adipocyte. The free fatty acids are getting taken up into the adipocyte. At the same time, insulin is telling the adipose tissue to upregulate GLUT4, okay? And GLUT4 is the insulin-dependent glucose transporter. GLUT1, 2, 3 are insulin-independent. GLUT4 is insulin-dependent. 
because glucose is now being taken up into the adipocyte at an elevated rate because of insulin elevating or increasing GLUT4 expression, you have a lot of glycolysis going on. A byproduct of glyco glycolysis is glycerol 3-phosphate. This glycerol is, gets joined into fatty acids, gets joined with fatty acids to produce triglycerides, and these triglycerides are then stored as fat. Okay. At the same time, insulin is going to the muscle cell. It's telling the muscle cell to upregulate GLUT4 to take up glucose. It's telling the muscle to utilize glucose in glycogen production. So insulin stimulates the establishment of glycogen stores in muscle cells. Insulin is also telling the liver, it's not shown in this diagram, but insulin also stimulates protein synthesis in muscle. So it stimulates muscle buildup. Okay? Exercise as well upregulates GLUT4 expression, but for this diagram, it's insulin. So these are the four parts of your metabolic pathways which are happening in a well-fed state. Insulin doesn't have anything to do with the red blood cell and, and the brain because they're completely independent. Insulin doesn't tell the liver to take up glucose because the liver upregulates GLUT2, which is not insulin dependent. But insulin stimulates all these metabolic paths within the liver. It stimulates glucose uptake in the muscle cell and uh, in the muscle cell and in the adipose tissue. It also upregulates LPL. So it's stimulating the utilization of glucose in energy, the storage of glucose as glycogen, the production of fatty acids from glucose, the uh, packaging of fats as triglycerides into VLDLs, the deposition of fat. In within adipose tissue by upregulating LPL and the simultaneous uptake of glucose into the adipocyte by upregulating GLUT4 and at the same time also upregulating GLUT4 in the muscle to upregulate glucose uptake in the muscle to stimulate glycogen stores, to establish glycogen stores and to stimulate protein synthesis and muscle buildup. Okay. As you can imagine, because insulin is doing all these things in diabetes, none of this is happening. So the body doesn't know what to do with all the glucose. So the glucose just stays elevated in bloodstream and you have chronic hyperglycemia, which eventually comes down because of the red blood cell and the brain, which we said, which we discussed in the glucose tolerance curve. This is what the doctor wrote. Immediately after a meal, blood glucose levels rise and stimulate the release of insulin by the pancreatic beta cells. Insulin mainly acts on the liver, the muscle, and the adipose tissue. The, the Specific effects it has on each of these organs are very different. So insulin promotes glycogen synthesis in the liver and the muscle. After the glycogen stores are full, the liver converts excess glucose to fatty acids and triglycerides. Why? Because we discussed that fat is the major storage form of energy in the body. Insulin promotes triglyceride synthesis in adipose tissue by stimulating LPL to extract the fatty acid, by stimulating glycolysis because more glucose is going into the liver, so it's stimulating the production of triglycerides. At the same time, it's promoting glucose entry into the muscle cell and into the adipose tissue by stimulating GLUT4. After a meal, most of the energy needs of the liver are met by the oxidation of excess amino acids. Two, two tissues, the brain and the red blood cells, are insulin independent because of GLUT1 and GLUT3. The brain derives energy from glucose both in well-fed and normal fasting conditions because we said the brain doesn't take up fatty acids because fatty acids cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. However, the brain begins to utilize ketones in a prolonged fast. Under all conditions, because the red blood cells lack mitochondria, they, they always use glucose anaerobically for all of their energy needs. This is a summary of the effects of insulin. It stimulates glucose transport in the skeletal muscle and adipose by GLUT4. It stimulates glycogen synthesis and storage. Stimulates triglyceride production. It stimulates sodium retention, it stimulates protein synthesis, it stimulates cellular uptake of potassium, not important for you to know. It decreases glucagon release. So this is how these hormones kind of influence each other, okay? This is the main important thing for you to know. These two boxes here, where the GLUT1 is, RBC's brain, GLUT2 is liver, insulin independent, GLUT1, insulin independent, GLUT3 in the brain, insulin independent, GLUT4, adipose tissue, and striated muscle insulin-dependent glucose transport is, okay? Good. So this is a question, just for your understanding. Researchers are investigating the relationship between glucose transporters and insulin concentration in different types of tissues. Experiments in which cells are taken from, experiments in cells taken from various tissue samples are exposed to various increasing conditions of insulin. The number of surface glucose transporters are then measured. The results of two cell samples are plotted on the graphs below. So they took two different cells from two different tissues and they exposed them to increasing glucose concentrations. 
And then they check whether the cell upregulates its blood transporter or doesn't. So you see here across a wide range of across pretty much all glucose concentration, this cell is has a very constant expression of glute proteins. That means these glute proteins are insulin independent. So this would be glute one, two, and three. So if they ask you which cell type there is this to most likely be, you would say the red blood cell, it could be the brain, it could be the liver. In contrast, this cell type, as you increase glucose uh, concentration or expose the cell to higher glucose concentrations, the glucose transporter expression increases. So this is GLUT4, and this cell type is, you, is likely to be either a striated muscle or a skeletal muscle or, the adip or an adipocyte. Okay? So now we'll shift gears to fasting now. So glucose decreases in fasting. This stimulates glucagon release. Glucagon acts on the liver initially. It stimulates glycogen breakdown by activating glycogen phosphorylase by phosphorylation. Glycogen gets broken down gets produced into glucose. Glucose goes out into the bloodstream to maintain blood glucose concentrations. At the gene level, glucagon and cortisol and epinephrine are also activating gluconeogenesis. But because gluconeogenesis is happening at the gene level, it's taking a bit more time to happen. Okay? Remember what I told you to remember from gluconeogenesis. We need a source of pyruvate. So what's how do we get pyruvate for gluconeogenesis? Number one, from the red blood cell. Because the red blood cell all of it, the glucose it utilizes eventually gets produced into lactate because it doesn't have mitochondria. This lactate gets, goes back to the liver, goes to the liver, gets converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate gets converted into glucose. Okay, so that's number one. Source number one of pyruvate for gluconeogenesis. Source number two is muscle protein breakdown. The, in, the decrease in insulin, which stimulates muscle protein buildup, the decrease in insulin and the increase in epinephrine and cortisol in glucagon. All of that stimulates muscle protein breakdown into amino acids. These amino acids are funneled into alanine. Alanine goes to the liver. So in the in fasting conditions, you have elevated blood alanine levels. So one measure of fasting is to measure a patient's blood alanine levels. Alanine goes to the liver. It gets converted to pyruvate. Okay, Pyruvate uh, gets made into glucose by gluconeogenesis. So that's source number two of, gluconeo of pyruvate for gluconeogenesis. Now, if you go back to this diagram here, I told you that in fasting conditions, you have lipolysis. Triglycerides are broken down to fatty acids for beta oxidation to fuel gluconeogenesis. At the same time, the glycerol you're producing is getting made into glucose. So that's the third source of gluconeogenesis. Okay, It doesn't get made into pyruvate directly, but it's, uh, it's another source of gluconeogenesis, which is shown here. The acetyl, the fats that you're generating, the fatty acids you're producing get bound to albumin. They go into the muscle for beta oxidation to be used as ATP for in a fuel. Uh, also, fatty acids are going to the liver to produce acetyl-CoA, which is getting burned in the Krebs cycle as beta, uh, to produce ATP, which fuels glycolysis. At the same time, the, the glycerol generated from lipolysis is using being used to make glucose as a glucogenic substrate. Okay? So these are the four things, Yanni. So these are the three sources of the gluconeogenesis. In a prolonged fast, so now you notice here that the red blood cell is only utilizing glucose. It's not utilizing fatty acids. It's not utilizing um, ketone bodies. You see the brain here. It's not utilizing ket fatty acids. Fatty acids aren't get take aren't being taken up by the brain. However, in a prolonged fast, when acetyl CoA accumulates a lot and there's excess acetyl CoA, and you're producing ketone bodies, ketone bodies can cross the muscle to be used as ATP, and ketone bodies can also be uh, and can also cross the blood-brain barrier to be used as a fuel for energy in the brain. Okay, so they they can be made into acetyl-CoA and that can be made into ATP. Importantly, what happens is when ketone bodies cross the blood-brain barrier and the brain starts utilizing them, the acetyl-CoA levels in the brain start increasing. This, by feedback inhibition, shuts off the step of conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So this shuts off glucose utilization by the brain. In this way, this is a mechanism that your body's developed to save glucose for the red blood cell in prolonged fasting because the red blood cell doesn't have any other option other than glucose. By the brain utilizing ketone bodies and shutting off glucose utilization, it can save or spare a lot of the glucose for the red blood cell. That's one mechanism. That's one significance of this pathway. Another significance is that the, by the brain utilizing ketone bodies predominantly 
your demand for glucose in general in or in general decreases. This saves some of the muscle proteins from being broken down for gluconeogenesis. Okay, so it's two significances to uh, ketone body utilization by the brain. Number one, save glucose for the red blood cell. Number two, decrease body's demand for glucose and thereby spare muscle protein breakdown or decrease or decelerate muscle protein breakdown. Okay. This basically shows you uh, the timeline when you've ingested glucose that finishes very quickly. Glycogens, when you're fasting, starts to kick in very quickly and then goes down very quickly because you, your stores are limited. But why does it happen quickly is because it's activated by phosphorylation. Why does gluconeogenesis happen slowly? Because it's activated by the gene level, at the gene level, okay? So the doctor summarized what I've just said, Yanni. Glucose, glucagon, and epinephrine levels rise during an overnight fast. These hormones exert their effects on skeletal muscle, on adipose tissue, and the liver. In the liver, glycogen breakdown and the release of glucose into the blood are stimulated. This is called glycogenolysis. This is the first thing to kick in. Hepatic gluconeogenesis is also stimulated by glucagon. But the response is slower than that of glycogen breakdown because it happens or it's stimulated at the gene level. The release of amino acids from skeletal muscle and fatty acids from adipose tissue are both stimulated by the decrease in insulin and an increase in epinephrine. So the decrease in insulin and the increase in the counter-regulatory hormones, they're promoting muscle wasting. Okay. The amino acids and fatty acids are taken up by the liver, where the amino acids provide the carbon skeletons for uh, basically, they're made into pyruvate. So they're providing the carbon skeletons for pyruvate to be made into glucose. And the oxidation of fatty acids provides the ATP necessary for gluconeogenesis. So the amino acids are the substrate, amino acids, lactate, and glycerol. These four are the substrates for gluconeogenesis. Fatty acid oxidation is the fuel for gluconeogenesis. Okay. In a prolonged fast, levels of glucagon and epinephrine are very elevated. Glycolysis is occurring rapidly, resulting in excess acetyl-CoA that's used for ketogenesis. Levels of both lipids and ketones, therefore, are increased in a prolonged fast. The muscle utilizes fatty acids as the major fuel, but can use also utilize ketones. Red blood cells and renal medullary cells, but mainly the red blood cells, have no mitochondria, continue to be dependent on glucose for their energy. Regarding the brain, the brain adapts to using ketones for some of its energy after several weeks of fasting. The brain starts to approximately derive two-thirds of its energy requirements from ketones and only one-third from, from glucose. This shift from glucose utilization to a reliance on ketones as the major fuel diminishes the amount of protein that must be degraded to support gluconeogenesis, i.e. it's saving muscle wasting. There is no storage form of energy if energy storage form of protein because each protein has a specific function in a cell. Therefore, the shift from using glucose to ketones during starvation spares proteins, which is essential for these other functions. Okay. One of the last slides here. These are the fuels utilized by different organs in the body during fasting and during well-fed states. They can ask you this in the exam. Okay. The liver utilizes mainly glucose and amino acids during welfare states. It utilizes fatty acids during fasting conditions. Importantly, the liver does not utilize ketone bodies because the liver lacks the enzyme or the hepatocytes lack the enzyme thiopherase, which is required for the conversion of ketones eventually to acetyl-CoA and use for energy in the form of ATP. Skeletal muscles usually use glucose in fasting. They can use fatty acids and ketones. The same with the Cardiac muscle usually uses fatty acids, can switch to ketones. This is important for you to know. Brain al almost always utilizes glucose. Only in a prolonged fast, it can utilize ketones. Why not fatty acids? Because they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. The significance of ketones being utilized by the brain, it saves their glucose for the red blood cell and it spares muscle wasting or protein breakdown. Okay, The red blood cells always utilize glucose because they don't have mitochondria. If you understood all of the metabolic pathways we discussed, then it should be very easy for you to understand what happens in diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, you have an absolute insulin deficiency. And so you have a relative excess of the counter-regulatory hormones. You have an excess of epinephrine. You have an excess of glucagon. You have an excess of uh, cortisol. This leads to unopposed lipolysis because that's the effect of the counter-regulatory hormones. You have an increased delivery of the fatty acids to the liver, 
you have an increase in the production of ketone bodies, you have an increase in the level of triglycerides. So you have hyperlipidemia, you have hyperglycemia because the glucose isn't being utilized. And this hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, elevated ketone bodies and keto acids are acids, so they can cause acidosis. These form the triad of something called diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a complication of type 1 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, you have a little bit of the insulin effect happening because you have the insulin, the cells aren't just responding to it, but they're not completely resistant. There is some residual effect. So that's not an absolute insulin deficiency. That's a relative insulin deficiency. In the, in the setting of relative insulin deficiency, you don't have that much ketogenesis going on. So, so these type 2 diabetics, they don't develop ketoacidosis. They do develop hyperglycemia. They do develop hyperlipidemia. Importantly, the hyperglycemia, when it leaks out into the urine because glucose is osmotic, because glucose is osmotic, it drags out water and electrolytes. So these patients become dehydrated. And when you check their um, blood uh, osmolarity, the osmolarity would be elevated because of glucose. So in, in type 2 diabetics, they can develop something called a hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state because of relative, re relative insulin deficiency and minimal ketogenesis. In contrast, Diabetic ketoacidosis, which happens in type 1 diabetes, you have ketogenesis, you have hyperglycemia, and you have acidosis, and you have hypertriglyceridemia, uh, okay? Thank you very much, and that's it.